Know me a body. Hi. Hi. <laughs> you look so cute in your little like white headphones. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm here for it. Um, for anybody who does not know who you are, before we jump on into our conversation, who are you today? Sure. Um, today and every day, I am Nomi Abadi. I am a pianist, composer. I run a nonprofit called the Female Composer Safety League, and I'm an instrument inventor. And one less known fact about who I am not today, but used to be, was when I was a child, I was a ventriloquist. Wait, actually? Actually, for real. <laughs> I don't Does know that what skill... made me compelled to say that. I love that. Wait, does that skill go away? Is I mean, because you say it like a past tense. Um. It did. It does. I still have my dummy and I really love him. And I'm always trying to find a, like a, an excuse to bring him up. But you threw the ball so in my court that I, I got yeah. to mention Dennis. Wait, this is so <laughs> rad. What's your dummy's name? His name is Dennis. Um, <laughs> he was named after, do you remember Night of the Living Dummy, the Goosebumps yeah. book? He is named after Slappy's best friend, Dennis. And actually, he's the same model dummy as in the show. In the 90s. Wait. So I left. How long did you wait? How okay, I I know you're not here to talk about this, but this is an incredible <laughs> skill. So now I want to know. How did you first learn that you were good at this? Or how did you know that this was something you wanted to like learn? Or I mean, I, I always find that there's like the you know, like losing in the Olympics. Like I'm always like, who knew that this is what you wanted to do? Or bobsledding. It's like somebody was like, you know what you'd be really good at? These things. And I feel like ventriloquism is that's I have the same question. So Jennifer, it's very interesting that we're talking about this because it's actually going to segue perfectly into what I do today as a film composer. So allow right. me to just back it up a little bit Please back to do. the mid 1990s when I lived in New York. Um, <laughs> I lived in New York when I was eight years old. I went to the Mana School of Music. Um, I left my uh, world of Southern California, Orange County, Arabic Jewishness <laughs> mm -hmm. down south over there and went to New York. And when I went to New York, I was a very social but lonely child, mm -hmm. which is why I, <laughs> when I was homeschooled, I used to watch the Goosebumps show. It was on like every day at like 10 o'clock or something in the morning. And I was such a big Goosebumps fan. I was like, I think the Goosebumps, like, I think like, yeah, Goosebumps was like one of the hugest reasons why like I read as a little kid. Now I'm like a big time mm -hmm. reader. But when I was a little kid, I was like, I just devoured Goosebumps. I love, I mean, like I didn't really have a reference for horror or anything yet. Yeah. Um. So that was it. Uh. But I think it was like the, it was less than the 10th book. I feel like it was like the fifth book or something. I remember when they did the show and I was so obsessed with ventriloquist dummies and my my uh, vision of like what I thought that they were. And when I yeah. remember reading that book and being so scared of them. And then the show came out and I was in New York. I remember because it was um, it was near Hanukkah. And okay. when I was watching the show, I was like, oh, my God, the actress who played the girl who got to do the ventriloquism. She wasn't a real ventriloquist, but I could tell that like. She had had some training and I'm like, mom, can I, I want to be an actor and I want to play roles like that. Like I want, to, my, my mom was like, well, honey, I mean, if you want to yeah. be a ventriloquist, you can do that if you want to, you know, but we have to get you a dummy and that's like a big deal, you know? And I was like, oh my God, I want a ventriloquist dummy so bad. So I obsessed over it. Oh. And then on, in the middle of Hanukkah, in the middle of the floor, my parents surprised me with my ventriloquist dummy. It was just- Wait, sick. you were how old? Like eight? Is that what you said? I was eight. <gasps> Your parents are so cool. They're interesting. Definitely, they didn't believe in like putting me in regular school, but they're like, yeah. no, me can have a ventriloquist dummy. So because I was homeschooled slash also at Manus doing like after like uh, conservatory stuff there, um, I had all this like time and all I did was practice piano and hang out with my ventriloquist dummy. So back in the day, they came with these like little tapes, a little tape, like a cassette tape yeah. that you could study and it would teach you like how to do your, your, you know, vowels and like how to speak with like your mouth closed. And I haven't admittedly haven't done it in so long. I don't want to do it today, but I would have. I was going to say, I really want to hear. <laughs> I know. 
I might go grab Dennis and show him to you afterwards just because he's literally sitting in my grave. My cat was really scared of him, so he's in the closet. Uh, <laughs> monkey RIP. Um, so maybe Dennis has to come back out because monkey's gone, yeah. uh, which is a crazy sentence to um, divulge. But yeah, so I'm only talking about this so much because when Dennis and I would hang out, one thing that we used to do was we would watch TV and we'd watch movies. And one day I got in huge trouble because I didn't want to practice. So I was hanging out with Dennis and I was like, I want to do ventriloquism. I don't want to practice piano. And my yeah. parents who were my piano teachers were very upset at me. And they were like, well, we're going to go get dinner next door. We're going to take your brother because he was such a good little pianist. He practiced and you didn't practice. So you have to stay in your room. So I stayed in my room, which was my brother's in my room where we slept underneath my piano, uh, yeah. <laughs> a tiny little apartment in New York. Wow. And we turned on the TV and they left me up there with a show called Video Movie Magic. Okay. And Video Movie Magic was this unbelievable show that went into like how movies were made. And it would do like, they were like monster movies, which like backstage special effects, all that stuff. So I had this distinct memory when I first wanted to become a film composer and it was this night. My parents were wow. gone. My brother was next door with them getting dinner at this place called Dumpling King, which only went out of business in COVID. No. And it was a blizzard. I remember being so, so cold. And I'm sitting there with, with little Dennis and we're catching the end of video movie magic going into how they made The Exorcist. Wow. And I watched the horrors of the face of like Regan's face of The Exorcist. And like, and I'd, not, I'd only heard about this movie because my mm -hmm. parents had seen it back in the seventies, like in, in theaters. But I remember seeing like, oh my God, that this is that, that this is her. And I was so scared to death. So I'm like gripping my ventriloquist dummy. We're watching <laughs> a little bit of like, you know, Linda Blair being like, hey everybody, you know, with her makeup on. And I was like, whoa, what is this? And then the movie started. So they would like show how they made it and then they would play the movie. So while my family was next door, I ended up watching The Exorcist. Wow. Alone as an eight year old with my little dummy in my in like, like in my lap. So when my mom got home, she came home, I watched like the backward stairs walking down alone, like my mind was blown wow. away. And I just thought this score was so creepy The Mike Oldfield score. I just every element of it, I just was like, frozen and in awe of I can't believe what I'm watching. I was like traumatized, but I couldn't yeah. stop watching it. So my mom comes in, sees what I'm watching. She's like, no, turns off the TV. It was like, we're at the part where she's fully possessed. Like she had already been lifted <laughs> off the bed. Like I was like, the way there. mom knows. No, no. I'm like, so my parents, the, we all watched it together as a family. And I yeah. remember watching it, having my little dummy there and, and watching this movie and being like, well, the music is what like clicked in, yeah. you know, the dun 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 dun, dun, dun. It's so haunting and so pretty. And I thought, oh my God, I can play that on piano. So I ran to my piano and learned it and then just became obsessed with like horror scores. So that was the beginning of my like, oh my God, I started listening to like all this, all the little sound bites, like John Carpenter films wow. and all that just was so interesting to me. So I, I keep my little dummy as a little symbol of like, who I once was, but also like the, he was there with me during a very yeah. inspirational moment in my life. So. I mean, first and <laughs> foremost, I want to write a scene in a movie or a TV show that is this scene just visually in my brain. It feels so cinematic. So when I do this, I will reach out and we can have you do a cameo or we'll figure it out. Amazing. But I'll score I it just, for you. Um, done, sold, amazing. <laughs> I just, I feel like, I mean, you know, even in the beginning when you were like, I don't know why I brought this up, but it feels, the fact that you haven't revived Dennis in your current artistic sphere in some way actually feels like a disservice if I'm really being honest, because I don't know of any other human being who is combining what you do with <laughs> ventriloquism, let alone a dummy on stage that clearly was like instrumental in the moment that you discovered that this is your like love it it feels quite poetic that was a great pun also he was instrumental in <laughs> my composing career. i would love to say that i i meant that but <laughs> you know yeah of course Landed I meant that pun. Landed thank great. you so much yeah um this is i also am really grateful that you've kept him 
<laughs> Me you know, too. Because that could have. Oh, he's breakable. He's plaster. He's like he's yeah. a very delicate. He's really delicate. That's why he's he's wearing my brother's Lacoste baby shoes, which is. <laughs> <laughs> which my parents never bothered giving me uh, any such oh luxuries, but Dennis has them. So. Oh my God. Okay. So we've gotten here, <laughs> which unexpectedly, I never could have anticipated this being the beginning of your journey. And this is making me adore you even more. So you have just, well, actually doubling back even more, you were obviously p- playing piano from a bright, young, young age. If both of your parents were your teachers. Your brother was also playing. Clearly, piano was integrated in your life. Music was integrated in your life from a, like a starting point. Um, you know, so often kids, I feel like, resent that. Obviously, you had the moment that was like, no, this is something that I'm really good at. Let me make it happen. But I'm curious for you, your piano journey. And then let's jump into film composing because right. you, you teed us up beautifully. Oh, yeah. I absolutely resented every second of my piano background. <laughs> okay, <great. laughs> I, was, I was a very normal kid in that regard. I didn't want to practice. I wanted to go out yeah. and play. Um, so, yeah, my both my brother and I were piano prodigies, which I guess in some ways is like a well, now you're obligated (laughs) to do this thing, um, if I'm being fully honest about that. Yeah. Um, And I, I, and I, and I, I didn't dislike all of it. I loved performing, like loved it more than anything in the world. Like loved it, loved it. Um, I, my earliest memories at the piano were just that kind of, I was just kind of like born on the piano bench. So I, I don't really remember when I began piano. So I don't know if I had like, "Ah, I want to learn it. Um, but I, I do come from five generations of piano teachers. So as in, I'm the fifth, I'm a really mm-hmm. uh, uh, proud piano teacher. I love teaching piano, yeah. especially to kids who typically wouldn't play piano. I like to get them excited about piano, yeah. get gifted children, especially, um, or like unlocking those gifts is like important mm-hmm. to me uh, and teaching them to appreciate it and not to feel like they have to do it, but that to get them to want to do it is yeah. kind of like my, one of my reasons that I, I love to teach so much. Um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, my parents were my teachers. I didn't really have a way out of practicing. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I kind of, that was kind of my life. And um, I went to a Hebrew day school um, called Mora Shah, which was a trailer on wheels. And there were 60 kids in the entire school from preschool to sixth grade. So I kind of knew the same like five to 10 kids um, since I was like in preschool. But yeah. I skipped a lot of school. I only did a few hours a day of school just to go there for like to learn Hebrew and then like to basically see other children <laughs> and then um, mm-hmm. went home at lunchtime. So I actually didn't attend a full day of school until I was 13. Um, and I skipped kindergarten, first grade, half of third grade, fourth grade and sixth grade. So I, I barely did um, any of that school. I mostly homeschooled. So while I was homeschooling and, you know, the little tiny bits, I was at Morris Shaw, I was... Um, you know, I was a, 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 in a very musical family, like um, pretty much if we weren't playing piano, there was music playing. My dad had a mm. 10,000 record collection, all, wow. all classical records. Um, my parents were avid classical music fans just um, throughout the golden age of classical, like the 1960s. They saw pretty much everybody perform, um, you know, and have tons of stories. Of, and also like some, they, they were really into um, like they saw the Beatles on their first tour and they saw like, you know, the Rolling Stones and there were like 40 people in the audience. You know, so we had this, just a lot of stories, a lot of music. Um, but I probably liked to perform more than my brother did. He was a really good practicer and I was just, I wanted to wear cute dresses and be pretty and go and perform. <laughs> I wanted to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, fun isn't really, okay, let's do three hours of, you know, scales and repetitions and half yeah. tempo and click up the metronome one not you know notch at a time and for hours and hours on that and it was, was not super fun for me although i'm very grateful that that was my upbringing because by the time i was like before i was 11 i had already put in my ten thousand hours so i i became I, did, like, I had this proficiency at something that i just was i had like an aptitude for piano um, now I prefer, I, I have a lot more fun practicing these days <laughs> than I did yeah. when I was a little kid, but, um, I definitely sacrificed a lot for the art. Yeah. Well, how did you eventually then get to this film composing career mm-hmm. aspect of things? Because obviously we had this revelation moment, which I will never, ever forget and will forever be etched in my brain because it's incredible. Was there 
somebody that you were like, this is a point person that I get to now talk to about what it means to be a film composer and now I follow this trajectory? Was it like I go and put myself in these types of spaces and now I get to do it? Was it like, hey, person, I would like to make music for it? Like, how did you even know where to start? That's a really good question. Um, I think for most composers who have a very steady journey through composing, who are lucky enough to figure that out around the time that they go to college, so they go to film school or film scoring school, for example, Berkeley, first place that ever created a score, film scoring major, um, that would have been a wonderful place. I would have totally wanted to go there if I yeah. <laughs> had known that I was going to be composing back then. Um, I kind of knew as a little kid that I would always get there, but it was just a matter of like, well, one day I will be composing and that'll be kind of the thing I do forever and ever and ever. Um, and is that because you were like writing your own stuff already as a kid and you had all this music that you already had composed or was it just you loved the idea of composing music to visuals? Well, I love to write music and I like to create stories. So I, mm -hmm. as a little kid, I wanted to kind of be many things. I wanted to be an actor and which I was for a long time and still do as every time I can. I love to act. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be an author. I wrote a lot of stories. Like I wrote a little book when I was little. Like I, I really loved the idea of film composing because when it kind of clicked that, oh, I could do all these things at once. I could mm -hmm. still be part of the filmmaking process. I do love to write. I mean, of course, there's a the whole technical side of like arranging film music, which is really boring. And we don't have to talk about that now, but purely from the creative standpoint, it felt like, oh, I get to be this other character and make up my own character in this film. Um, and that was really exciting to me. So I did grow up watching a lot of, you know, kind of your your typical films that everybody watches who wants to be a composer. It's like, you know, E.T. It's like, oh, my God, you know, the, you know, of course, John Williams and everything that he ever um, put out has been, you know, perfect. <laughs> and, you know, um, we are moving into like a different territory with scoring, though. So when it comes to film scoring today, it's like this is the 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 industry is changing so much and the sound of film scores have, has changed so much. So, um, you know, when I first started composing, I was lucky to already know a lot of people in film because I was an actor. So mm -hmm. helping them with their projects or just kind of, you know, um, and I'm an outgoing composer, obviously, so, <laughs> which there aren't that many of us. So yeah. uh, I, I just had met a lot of people and I just started kind of you know, maybe several years ago, started scoring everything that I could, like kind of just being like, oh, does anyone have a project? Oh, can I just make you a, a score for that um, and learn my chops that way? Um, but now I'm actually kind of excited because I'm moving into a, um, a new zone for myself. I've actually never done any orchestral stage, like concert music ever, but I actually okay. have a piece of concert music that I'm premiering this summer. Um, for mm -hmm. my instrument, for my nori, which I'm really excited about. So kind of now broadening the film scoring over to concert music, and we'll see how that goes. Well, let's talk about your nori, because first of all, it's rad looking. Um, but I mean, I'll let you I'll let you talk about it. How did it come to be? Tell us what it is. It's super cool. <laughs> so I invented the world's first double guitar which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a guitar, but there's an extra keyboard. Um, or sometimes I think perhaps the guitar was missing a keyboard all along, which is why I never thought to play it. <laughs> I'm like, but I have, you know, I'm a pianist. I play with two hands. Why would I only play with one hand? It's, you know, so basically just created a, an instrument that allows, you know, this like contralateral keyboard. So it's a 72 keys total, tiny little keys on the left hand, which I use usually for like bass notes or low notes, single notes. And then that has a typical, you know, right hand keyboard. And um, yeah, I, I literally, it's a very short story. I was sitting in traffic on the 405 and I was playing on my seatbelt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, have God. you ever played like guitar, air guitar on your seatbelt? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, yeah. that's why I made an instrument. And you literally sat there and you're like, you know, what would be invented and be really smart would be a double, what is it called? Two plated? What is it? Two layered guitar? Yeah. Double what guitar. Well, I was like, double guitar. I was like, Oh, I, I have to find this instrument. I went looking for it. Like, and I realized it didn't exist. Yeah. So then I just had uh, my friend Ryan make one for me. And that's why it's called Nori, Nomi, Ryan, N-O-R-Y, get it? 
So yeah, anyway, my it. friends are Luthier, Warren Wagner. He's very good at what he does. And um, yeah, he makes like all kinds of medieval instruments and stuff like woodworking. So I just yeah. was like, hey, can you, can you, if I like found the internals for it, could you like house this in like a, in this kind of a shape? And we just figured it out and I had to make it. And now I have, now I have it. And then I patented it. And um, yeah, so, and then they granted it, which I couldn't believe. So like we actually got, I got my patent granted on the second try, which. Congratulations. I was super glad about. Thank you. I think they probably were like, every single instrument has really been invented. Like, have you been to the uh, MIM Museum, which is the Musical Instrument Museum? Oh. And it's in Phoenix, Arizona. It is so cool in that it goes through every single continent, most countries, and the origins of music and where it all, like the instruments themselves, they usually have like an instrument from its inception. And then like, you know, if you have this little bamboo with the little string and how that eventually became the oud or whatever it is, right? It's just, so it has the entire like globe of all these instruments. And then you can also go around with it and listen to all the different music samples. And sometimes they have video samples as well of, of how these different instruments are played. Clearly America doesn't have um, many of their own original ones because we've you know taken from so many places. <laughs> but I don't know the last time that like an instrument has been like invented in the more recent years. Well, so invented maybe more often than we think, but but employed and like employed. used. I don't. Yeah, know. that's what I mean. It's really yeah. Oh, definitely people are yeah. making, but in terms of like the yeah the. Yeah, no, the I know actual, a lot like, of synth creators who are really cool, and they're always making their own stuff. Even Imogen Heap actually made a really really cool instrument, yeah. or two or three, maybe I don't know. Maybe she's got a bunch now. I don't know, but she's. I mean, I think um, instrument creating is really fun, and 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 I and I. There are a lot of instruments that need improvements <laughs> that deserve yeah. re reboots. So I feel like that, you know, I don't know, that's a place that I can imagine um, more kind of mainstream instruments coming out. But um, yeah, no, I've never, I'm embarrassed to say I've never heard of that museum and now I want to go. It's, it's it was actually that's one really of the coolest cool. museums I've ever been to. Um, I love that you invented this. I love that it's patented, Mazel Tov. Thank you. Um, do you feel like it's, for people who want to visually look more like guitarists and bassists, or is it people who are just a little bit more contemporary in the way that they play piano? Like who is this instrument ideally designed for? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say all of the above. Like um, actually, it, once again, kind of stems back from when I was a little kid, I didn't like to sit on the piano bench. Like I had, I had mm -hmm. so much energy. That was why it was hard for me to practice. I wanted to go running around and like get up, you know, I wanted to get up yeah. all the time or like eat or do, I was like, just really had a lot of energy. So it's kind of my answer to like, Hey, look, I can like stand up and play. <laughs> I can yeah. stand up and do this. Like, Oh, this is so much fun. Like pianists, when you're sitting at a piano, and let's say you're on stage with other people, like you're kind of in your like drummers or have the same, mm -hmm. <laughs> have the same luxury, but also a limitation where like you're in your little zone and you're kind yeah. of in your little box. You don't get to carry it around with you. But with Nori, I actually get to like communicate with other musicians I'm playing with or just, yeah. you know, it, the body language is a huge part of it and it changes the way that I play. So my playing is actually quite different on Nori, both because yeah. it's just a completely different instrument, but because it's like my whole just the relationship with the instrument is totally different. And so I yeah. totally, I a hundred percent just want to be honest. There is for sure a, a jealousy that all musicians have who are not guitarists. <laughs> I just yeah. wanna, if they say <laughs> they don't have it, they're lying. I mean, guitar is the coolest instrument. We all know it. Um, <laughs> they all look great when they do it. Everybody is it your favorite it. or coolest? No, I think it's probably the coolest. I love guitar, okay. but I mean, I'm, I've never had a desire though to play guitar. Interesting. Ever. I just, I just like things with keys. I like buttons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is like my, you know, guitar with buttons. I mean, yeah. It's so cool. Y'all, you'll see in our show notes, if you click uh, Nobi's site uh, that we will have linked, the photos that you have are super rad, but also just the instrument itself is so cool looking and what a cool little thing. Okay. We're going back to your film composing again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep us getting there. Um, great. So you decided through all of these things, you blah, 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 you got to this point. It was like the decision has been made that this is something that you're going to try to throw yourself into in some capacity, whether it's, you know, as a many hatted person who was involved in all the different aspects of the creation or um, just the composing. 
kind of again going back like how did you how do you know what to do is it are you a visual first person is it like let's talk tone and then you just have these ideas that you've been wanting to do and then you see how they connect like what is your beginning your end what is your process yes sure sure so a lot of the process technical stuff aside we'll talk about that a little bit in a second if it's relevant but the creative process is very similar to everything that i have ever learned as an actor you have to know your story you have to know whose story it is you need to know your subtext you have to understand the moment before you have to and then like you said the tone all of this is is essential so when i'm watching a movie and I know I'm going to score it and I'm trying, you know, at first I just try to get to know the movie very well. So I don't think about what I'm going to do musically at all. I just get to just kind of immerse myself and get to know what is the story? What is this about? Um, and are you on board from the get with the script before they've even filmed? Or is it more like we have our basic edit or we're in editing process? I want you to be in the room while we're editing or whatever. Sometimes it depends. It's like all over the board. I've done everything from be on deck from before the thing even begins. And it's just like, they have me in mind as like, you know, what we want to do and we build it together. Or I've come in to rescue a score after someone already did it <laughs> and I have to go back wow. and redo it. And then we're on like an eight day, you know, or less you know, timeline. <laughs> like it's kind of, yeah. as a composer, you kind of get, yeah, yeah, you work with what you got. Um, okay. And no unions, we can talk about that or not, but everything that comes with that is, it's kind of all over the place because we're all freelance. So we all kind of step on at whatever point. Um, but when I've been lucky enough to be on these projects where I know what, where I get to have creative, you know, input or be part of the creative input, I guess, at the beginning of the process, the first thing I like to do is get to know that story really well. Mm -hmm. And then like we would for acting, we always want to figure out like, what's my relationship to this material? How do I relate to, to, to this, right? Like if I'm maybe, maybe this is something that means something to me on a personal level, or I can relate um, in some way, I always find what brings me closer to the material. Um, doesn't matter what it is. Um, even for The Exorcist, I'm sure if I sat with it, I could tell you exactly why whatever scene, whatever yeah. thing I relate to. I certainly know what it's like to need to expel something from me that I don't want in there anymore. You know, I could probably have a lot of fun making my own score to that or whatever. Yeah. Um, but what I, it, it's a very non-linear uh, process that I like to start with. So I really start there. I try to come up with like, um, you know, either through the film itself or through... Um, uh, outside visuals, sometimes I'll think of like two or three, three usually like um, images that kind of like speak to me about like, what is this really about? Because a lot of what happens on the screen, I mean, yes, it's a visual medium, visual storytelling medium, but a lot of what happens on the screen is just a piece of the of the mm -hmm. really guttural story, right? That's what the score does. The score gives you what you don't get already on the screen or it deepens what you already have on the screen. So when I find myself like kind of attached to the material and I'm thinking about like, you know, what is this really about? Then you get to the subtext point. And one of my favorite parts of this process is like when I get to dip in and be like, what am I going to use to tell the story? Like what instruments am I going to use that mm. directly for me comes out of, unless there's like a specific request and someone is like dead set on like, they want a string score or they want like an electronic thing or whatever. I usually try to source off of, um, the sources in the film, like if there is a texture to the film or if there is like some um, like Pinocchio is such a great example of this, like the Guillermo del Toro film, like um, mm -hmm. Alexander Desplat used all hollow instruments for the entire score. And they're all hollow wooden instruments for the mm -hmm. entire score. And that just added it added so much life and character to Pinocchio. Um, but you don't think about it. It's not like in your face. It's just like yeah. it works in some like magical way. Uh, that part of the process is so exciting to me. It's so much fun. It's like putting together a puzzle that my take on it is going to be very different than someone else's. And then yeah. once I set up all those staples, like then I get to just kind of write and then all the technical and, <laughs> and, and programming stuff <laughs> that yeah. comes along with it, which is not as exciting. So we don't want to talk about that today, I guess, at all. But um, yeah, that's that's my process, and it's it's like um, 
I'm trying to think of like, there's any, and that's kind of what's exciting about doing the orchestral stuff. Like when I'm not film scoring, now I'm doing like, I'm staring at my quartet that I'm working on for Nori. And it's just very, I still have to like find, I've had to like find my own visuals and kind of still walk myself through this type of process with it. Cause I'm still mm-hmm. used to the storytelling part of it is, is just, it's all about the story. It's all about what the main character is going through and, and how to, kind of lead you as a viewer from like one moment to the next yeah. in a really, you know, subtextual way. That's very hard yeah. to do. It's actually really, really hard, especially under Correct. Yeah. Correct. I think that's why I'm so fascinated by it because I forget where I had seen this. There was some, maybe it was a documentary or it was like some clip somewhere where they took the same, was it a movie? I don't, I honestly don't even remember the specifics. I just remember how it made me feel where they took the same exact visual of something famous and they literally put different musical scoring underneath it. And just the way I remember like watching this same clip over and over and over again with all these different compositions underlaid. And I was like, oh my God, I'm having a different visual and experiential and emotional experience just watching the same exact thing with all this different music. And that was the first time that I remembered thinking explicitly about the music. And now I can't not think about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I don't compose, but like, I, you know, when I watch the last of us versus watching, you know, love is blind. And I'm thinking about the song choices that they have for either. It's very different, you know, and like what is going on for the, I don't know if it's like the, I don't like this word. I don't have another word for like manipulation, but like the, like the manipulation of my feelings as I watch these things is very real. And if you, if I watched it on mute, I would not have the same experience at all, at all. It it drives me nuts. My husband likes to watch things late at night on mute. And every time I see him, like I'll fall asleep. So I don't see that he's doing that, but he'll tell me the next day, oh yeah, I watched this episode. I'm like, no, the score is so good. Why did you watch it on mute? I can't believe you would do that. I have like a, the only things I'll watch on mute are like a commercial, no offense, because I've freaking done some commercial music. I'm like, I'm sorry for all my friends because that's stock music. But the, 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 like, you know, if I'm watching, like, I don't know, um, like, like, I guess like um, a cooking show. But even then, I'm like, oh, there's still like, I still like to listen to music. I don't know. Yeah, there's still like, like Chopped has that music that happens when all of a sudden, like the clock is ticking and now they're trying to get their things done in the amount of time. Like the, there is a there is the ticker, um, like the anxiety music, whatever. Yeah. I, I don't even know what that's called. But they're Maybe absolutely. Maybe that's why I like to watch cooking shows without the music because it stresses me yeah. out so much. Yeah. Because that's what the music helps you do, right? It puts you absolutely. on that time crunch. You're going with them on the time crunch, like a uh-huh. journey. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it's yep. music, uh, especially underscoring which is when dialogue is happening and the music that's underneath that's always like really kind of an inch I feel like there are two different like models for like film you know traditional film scoring one is like the theme music and the other one is underscoring so theme music is what every composer loves the most I want to say I mean I I've never met a composer who's like I I'd ra- I don't like to write themes um but I always really love the opportunity to write a great theme um one thing yeah. I'm, I'm really truly loving about this orchestral experience too keep bringing yeah. up <laughs> no please I think I think the thing that I find so fascinating and please correct me if I'm wrong but do you feel in some ways like you are like a doctor for people's hearts. (laughs) What I mean mean by that is like you in the end get to choose how somebody's going to experience the thing that you are visually seeing. Again, obviously there's other people who are like yaying and neighing and being like, we need more of this and we don't want this. And we obviously want this to overwhelmingly feel this type of thing. Like we're guiding you in a direction. But in the end, like me sitting down and crying to something has to do with how you created that whole experience. Thank you. There are some people who are like, I don't even listen to the film music. And I'm like, but you do. You just don't know. But do you? you do. That's that's the thing. It's like this silent – like. <laughs> Again, I don't, you know, have the intimate experience of doing it. But after watching that thing where they showed all the different, like all they played all the different music for the one thing, I was like, I am, I have been denying, actively denying my own senses of tuning into this other part that I think is just a visual medium, but it's not. I'm crying, <laughs> you know, like on this couch. 
And if I muted this, I wouldn't. Yeah. Well, the viewer, viewers are brilliant. Viewers are the perfect ones. They're the ones who know what how something affects them and if it works, if it doesn't work. As a composer, I have to usually, 99% of the time, we lift off, lift off of what is already there. So mm -hmm. with respect to the projects that I worked on and just how the great, you know, the high level of acting, for example, it's like, mm -hmm. I got, I think like, you know, all of it plays such an important role, right? That's the magic of cinema is like, there's just like every, sure. but like everybody kind of does the same thing for the films. Um, I don't think there's any medium that doesn't, that isn't really crucial um, or that I can say, oh, this sure. job is more, you know, more impactful than this one or like, you know, but I, I really do feel privileged to be able to do something that feels like um, manipulative, as you say, yeah. <laughs> but I don't, yeah. I don't know what the other word is, but I'm trying to say like, you know, we do, we do um, want to make sure that we're like carrying the viewer through the experience that the yeah. director wants them to have. Correct. And you have, you could definitely disrupt that with, in, with, I would almost say incorrect scoring, but you can disrupt it with unhelpful scoring or disruptive yeah. scoring. Um, so there is definitely a an art to making sure that things are el that the right points that the director wants are elevated. You know, yeah. and a lot of that actually is from silence. Like silence mm -hmm. is really underrated, and choosing when to be silent that's something that I'm yeah. still. <laughs> learning in life but <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that one society but i'm still <laughs> also learning it in my in my stories oh my god i felt that so deeply for myself as well <laughs> ooh, ooh, oh yeah a... and, and i will just sign off that topic with this one last little bit any issue that anyone has with themselves I'm speaking for myself when I say this, it'll come out of my story. <laughs> so I'm yeah. like, my teacher the other day, because I'm working with this amazing teacher named Yoonji Lee from Berkeley, just a little bit on my um, quartet, because like, like I said, I've never done a quartet before. So I'm like, well, I want to, you know, get help from <laughs> the Berkeley crew. So I'm like, you're working with this woman. She's like, yeah, you just take a long time to make your point. And, and she was talking about my music. And I was like, oh, my God. I feel so attacked. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I feel seen. I feel seen, seen. And I'm going to, yeah, going to leave this room immediately. Thank so you so much. It's a very, very personal experience. It's very, it's, I feel film scoring just as vulnerable as acting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When do you feel like it all kind of clicks for you? Is it when you are in your own space and you've, you know, laid out your pieces and then you are inspired and then creating? Is it more once the creation's been done and you've shared it with the team and your fellow collaborators and it's like, ooh, let's marry this? Or what about if we play with it? Like what part of it is really the part that like lights something in you or does it change on each project? I was going to say what clicks after it's all done and I've seen that it was accepted and I've finished watching the movie and it, the music <laughs> stayed there. That's what right. I know it's clicked. Right. Uh, no, right. no, but I, I know what you're saying. You're saying like, what well, kind of what's the like, what's the jump off and go of, yeah. of that? Or for you and like the satisfaction part or do you ever feel satisfied or is it like, do you seek the validation? I don't know. I think there's like, everybody's different. Every obviously. artist is like, oh, we always yeah. want our work to be accepted, but like <laughs> accepted like, whoo, like, you know, of course you yeah. want it to, to feel good. But I feel that the, you know, the collaborating, the collaborative process is, is, I love it. I love working with directors. Every director is different, producers and directors. Mm -hmm. I think having had just the opportunity to work with like, I think 30 different directors at this point, I've so just cool. kind of figured like how, out the kinds of people I like to work with. I love really collaborative projects, especially. I really like being included in that part of the process. I like when the music can ahead of time, like if I have a suggestion, then a director is open to hearing like some little thought I have that, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we did this with when I'm writing it? Like, oh, let's, yes, that's great. And then I'm going to take that idea and like, I'm going to, I'm going to, as I'm filming the rest of it, I'm going to have that in mind. You know, it can kind of, yeah. I really like to be included as much as I can in the whole production process, um, even though I know that that's not always yeah. possible. But I just love movie making so much. And yeah. if in another lifetime, if I had one more career to pursue, for sure, and anyone who knows me really well, and now that you know me pretty well, yeah. you know this, uh, it's not going to surprise you, but I would have loved to get involved in special effects and like monster making yeah. and all that. Like to me, it's like, oh. I, just I mean, it's never too late. Us. Obviously, you know, there's like a lag in terms of, you know, the amount of years that you've had, you'd have behind you. But that doesn't mean, I mean, look, there's time. I mean, I did one music video where I, I, I did like 
I did make like half of a dragon. There was like a half dragon and then I like finished, I made it so that you could like, I made the bottom jaw so it could like, yes. so it could like chomp because um, it didn't open its mouth. I put like teeth on it and like, and that was so cool. So one day I will find a way yeah. to do that, but I'm going to lean more into composing for the time being. <laughs> yeah. How do you find the people to work with or are you at the point now that people find you? Both. I think through actually through my acting crew has been just like I think like that that was such an important I just think it's so important for composers and this is like my one of my resourceful tips that I want to share if anyone here is yeah. thinking about becoming a composer or composing already I know I'll probably agree with this like that when you find outside of your own circle if you meet more people it's amazing how many people can kind of lead to other things bigger things and other relationships so relationships are important but for me um I really like to look outside the composing community for work. <laughs> and that's not because I just don't have enough friends in the composing community. I, I love my community. But the the most, um, I think the most fruitful things for me as far as like finding work and getting work and being able to, to sustain freelance life. I have been doing freelance more than half my life at this point. I'm not ashamed to say I'm 35. I've been freelance since I was 17. I've never had a regular job ever since I, since I was in college and put myself through college by being a freelance musician. And so I've done that because I love people and Part of that was being deprived from people. <laughs> Hence, we started off talking about, you know, my being a ventriloquist or wanting no. to be one, thinking that it would make me cool, right? I was like, oh my God. Now it does. Wait till but now it does. This back. is a full circle moment. Now I'm like, oh my God. Cool. I know. I'm like, little yeah. Nomi, you were such a cool little kid. I wish I could go yeah. back and tell you how cool you were. You thought Truly you were bad. so like, you thought you were so different and unique in a bad way, yeah. but like you were so cool. Um, yeah. But I, but I digress. I mean, like you know, um, you never know who you're going to click with. And I think, like, for composers, to go back to my point, <laughs> as my teacher has pointed out, let me get back. Let me actually say what I was going to say. What I was going to say was um, that my my love for composing really comes from being able to talk to other people about who are not part of the composing world, and um, and I've done that by jumping into other roles roles as an actor. I've also produced, I've also directed. I also love to puppet make. I like to, um, I've done even like script supervising once. I just, wearing all those different hats and just stepping outside of the composer, it's really important. For composers, especially, we spend so much time indoors and inside and not just indoors, but like in our studios at all, sometimes all hours of the day and night that if you're just going to be relying on that from things on that side of the computer, you're really missing, like, to me, what is the most exciting part of the process of like the how it all gets made. So be curious and go out there and like find other rules, even if it means you're going to be volunteering and like just be a gaffer in a film. It doesn't matter what film it is. Just go and involve yourself in the process and you never know like what's going to click or who you're going to meet or like what kind of inspiration you're going to get just from being on the other side of things or on another yeah. side of things. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's the same for anything really, you know, it's like, how are you, if, if you're storytelling about the human condition in any medium, whether it is through music or whether it is as an actor and, you know, performing or whatever, where are you pulling from if you don't have life experience or you haven't lived a little bit or you haven't put yourself in an uncomfortable position or tried something new or met somebody out? Like, I, I think for me, for my money around it. And certainly when I coach and I teach, it's like, what are your hobbies? Like, what are you doing this weekend to reset and come back to yourself? Like, yeah. where are you finding joy away from the the job, away from the craft? All of that is going to inspire you, whether you're aware of it or not, or whether it takes a hot second or not for it to like sink in. That's only going to be integrated later into the process as you start to actually pull from other things. Um, that is what makes you, as in like the general you, your voice, yours. It's like getting all of that experience and also just like living, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's so, it's so true. It's like the inspiration doesn't always come from the source. It comes from Correct. like the how you find the source in your life outside. Correct. Correct. Well, I'm curious if you're cool to switch gears for a second, what made you 
create, found, start uh, the Female Composer Safety League. Yeah. <laughs> Usually this is all I talk about on podcasts. So this is I so know. much more fun to talk about this other stuff. <laughs> no offense to the most beautiful group. I love the group, but I love yes. you know, Like I don't get to talk to, so much about like, you know, what I'm doing outside of that, which is such a small. Which but is it's a, also, I would imagine that, the foundation for how, where this came to be to begin with. It's like, this exactly. is, I don't know, for me, I always... It's why I asked, like, who are you today? Like, all of these things are because for me, what's interesting is, like, the human being who's sitting in front of me, all of – it's literally what we just said. Like, the life experience, all the other inspiration is only going to be what gets to the other things that are, like, the quote-unquote successes or the accomplishments that people are attributing to you rather mm -hmm. than recognizing that it all comes from somewhere. So, yep. yeah, where did this come from? Yeah. This came from the Female Composer Safety League, FCSL, came from – pretty, something pretty simple. I was um, groomed and abused as soon as I became a film composer by someone I really admired, who was um, instrumental in my starting my career. <laughs> and um, at the very start of my career. But once I found my way out of that situation, I discovered that I was not the only one not I don't know about this person, but I could tell you that this is a, this is unfortunately something that I started hearing a lot about the more I started connecting with the women, especially in my community, and some men in my community, but predominantly, women in my community. And the reason why so much abuse happens in composing, unfortunately, is because it's such a male dominated industry for one. Um, not that there's anything really you know, wrong with men, but there's something wrong with men dominating an industry for hundreds of years and there not being any union and there not being any place to facilitate change. So I found that I couldn't really Community. I, I was in the acting world <laughs> where I'm used to expressing myself the most. Um, most expressive people I know are definitely in my community are all my actor friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're way more open about talking about, you know, where these feelings come from. And, all, and I think that's just important. And not because I want to trauma bond with anybody, but because I think it's important to be like, you know, this stuff affected me and affected who I am. And so what happened to me is going to affect my work. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I mean, there's like, there's this unfortunate thing that, that is just in my community, which is that my community doesn't want to talk about stuff. They don't. So therefore, they won't acknowledge the issue. So a lot of these spaces are very abusive, perpetually abusive spaces. And then we've just become kind of groomed as an industry into thinking that it's normal to take people's credit, to sexually abuse them sometimes trigger warning. Um, but also, you know, grooming, manipulation, there's a lot of like, you know, um, there's a lot of people who I think become, you know, find themselves, for example, in like a music studio and might think that they're there to write music, but they're they end up scrubbing toilets and that, you know, and then they can't talk about it because everyone signs an NDA and that goes on and who knows what happens behind these closed doors. So it's just like, there's so much like trauma <laughs> happening in this industry. And I'm kind of like, why don't we why don't we address that? And then the Me Too movement happened. And I was like, okay, let's address it. And then I still didn't want to address it. I'm like, okay, well, if no organization wants to address it, and there's not going to be a union, we can talk about that another time. But there's a lot of reasons why we can't or why we don't have a union in composing. Um, they, are, they stretch from everything from it's not feasible for totally legitimate reasons to not feasible for totally not legitimate mm -hmm. reasons. Um, comes down to who's really in power, but for another time. Um, <laughs> but um, so anyway, I, instead of trying to change spaces, I just thought I'll create a new space and see if uh, this is useful for even one other person. And yeah. sure enough, it turns out it is very useful for hundreds of other people. And um, we got a lot of press immediately, pretty much. We got before we even had our 501c3 status, which we just got last September. Um, it's very new nonprofit, but we got, you know, a three page spread in the Hollywood Reporter women's issue in 2021. And then we just just had this uh, article that came out in The Guardian, which I think I sent to you about, you know, it's a dismal article. It's about like, you know, worker, worker slash assistant mentee mentor problems that are rampant in the industry. And um, I, but I find that like instead of focusing on like the space exists not to focus on the trauma space exists so that we can learn how to create a safe environment so our model is always like it's an agreement based room a like room that mm -hmm. thrives on creative agreements that we can share with each other all get on the same page and then move forward not in a power over dynamic but in like a, a 
in a community equal level, like true equality. And I have to say, it feels really good <laughs> to be in that space. It's just kind of become part of the way that I just kind of like to emerge into any space that I'm in. It's not just like an FCSL thing, but an agreement that I like one agreement. I have them up, up right here, but like, I'll just re read a really random yeah. one. Um, okay, here's one. No judgments or disclaimers or self judgments. Love it. <laughs> Everyone, it's like, in what room would that would not be a positive? <laughs> like how yeah. that is. So it's a lot of joy has come from this. A lot of like a lot of, you know, survivors, of course, who we want to help get out of situations, um, give them legal support, um, which is another lovely thing that we're really happy to be able to offer is I think mm -hmm. connect a lot of people with proper, you know, ranging all kinds of, of legal support and all over the world, um, mainly here and in the UK, we've been able to, to um, help some people seek justice if that's what they want. Um, but again, if it is what if, if it's what they want, if they're like, I really want to continue to work where I am, but I don't like know how to like, where to take my grievances to, you know, what, even if it's just having an ally to talk to somebody, about, like, what are mm -hmm. you experiencing? Like, you know, and then give them that resource of every two weeks, we have a meeting with all the members of FCSL, and we have a different speaker come, we would love to have you by the way, come and speak sometime. Um, okay. Like I don't know what I'd speak to for composers. But. Yeah. Like, I would love to hear about like, you know, how you started your podcast. I mean, it, it, like we, yeah. we just believe that like, you know, there's just, there's a lot to learn from those who are open to speaking about it. So that's mm -hmm. a very uncomfortable thing, I think for my industry, but luckily um, composers aren't the ones hiring other composers in the long run. So they don't yeah. have to love what I'm doing. I know they appreciate it on some level. And I know that what we've been doing has affected, already affected change. We're already putting kind of that pressure on other organizations to adopt their own safety protocols or to Stop, start to talk about trauma. Um, so I think that's that's been really rewarding to see is that like this this group took off very quickly. It took yeah. off like uh, just an idea that I had to try, try to create a community because community is so important to me. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's like all I've talked about this whole time. It's like collaborating <laughs> and community. Um, and that's important. It's important that we don't go through difficult situations alone, um, especially yeah. without a union. And especially when we have like I'm an incredible new generation of composers who deserve amazing careers without trauma and women, mm -hmm. <laughs> girls Correct. and women um, having, you know, access to those same opportunities that are safe as men do. Um, so there, so that's, that's it. And then I guess one more call to my little, little kid life is that if I, my mom one time read me my report card. Okay. And I think it's interesting because this really speaks to the way that I like to do all things in my life. But <laughs> the report card, when you're in preschool, they don't tell you what grades you got. They tell you about yeah. like who you are. So in the report card, it's like, oh, Nomi doesn't like to play the same games that the other kids play. She likes to make up her own games. And then she has yeah. the kids come over and play those instead. Yeah. So was like when I was three, this is what I was doing. And I'm like, I'm yeah. 35. This is exactly what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, your things are fine. They're great. I'm going to make another one. You guys want to come over here? <laughs> so yeah. I, just, I don't mean instead of what you're doing, but I mean, in addition to like, I'm kind of, I always like to do my own thing, my instrument, same thing. It's like, I, I see I it a that. certain way. I want to do it my way. And um, it's okay if somebody doesn't want to do it too, but it's there. And I, I mean, I, that's part of being a creator is like, how do we, Correct. how do we like make it so possible to get people excited about creating their own spaces and envisioning like what we want the future to be? Like there's, I have a yeah. very clear idea of what I want for the future, not just for myself, but for my whole industry. Like, yeah. what can I do to help carry people there and like rise up and like, you know, do the best we can to, to get there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the reason why I have that group, but it does make it possible because it's such a great community of women that like, and our allies, but, um, women and non-binary composers, uh, that's, that's our, those are the ones who are most affected by trauma. <laughs> so that's why we yeah. have a very targeted, very special, um, kind of special targeted group of people who are in our group. Um, but it makes it possible for us to be able to do what we want to do. So yeah. I have to say my relationship with my industry completely changed for the better once that group really took form. Um, it's an incredible group and we are, we really just don't have any place for shame. We, we are really, really, really supportive and it really helped me um, reintegrate after something happened to me at the beginning. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for creating a space that didn't exist before. Um, but I think even more importantly, you're bringing up 
this universal notion that um, we, as a generalization, tend to forget that we're not alone and to know that there is a space that you can even just simply be in conjunction with that you don't even have to necessarily participate in, but you know even exists to potentially support you when and if you need it. There is a feeling of levity. There is a feeling of being held. There is there is a feeling of potential hope to just know that there are people who are doing a thing that you might even need or maybe don't need, but it, that it exists. And so, you know, in my mind, there is nothing more powerful than that, that even if somebody doesn't feel necessarily compelled at the current moment in their lives to be a part of the league that you created, they know in the back of their brains that God forbid, or even if not God forbid, even if just one day they decide to, it's there. Um, and there's safety in that and there's comfort in that. And it's also a, another beautiful reminder that you are not alone. Um, and so often in this industry, no matter what hat you're wearing, it feels really isolating and that no one's no one's feeling exactly what you're feeling or no one's been there before or this is or if you speak out, you can't, you know, X, Y and Z, like all of it, you know. And so what a gift you're giving people in your community to have a space to feel seen and heard. Um, and there's a reason it took off so quickly because clearly there was a need that wasn't being met. Um, and also, thank you so much for everything you just said. And I completely yeah. agree with that. And I also think that one thing that's special, too, is like as women composers, when we want feedback, that's a very big deal. I want to I want to ask for feedback. But if I post about it in some group, I'm going to get bullied. Yeah. So it's not like mm -hmm. judgment. Gonna, uh. So just our feedback corners are really great. <laughs> so I'm like, when yeah. we get feedback, I'm like, we're, we're all really talented. We're all seasoned composers. So it's like when we give each other feedback, we're able to do it in a way that like, we're not doing it out of our ego. We're mm. actually creating a safe space to bring all kinds of things to, which was kind of yeah. unexpected. I thought, you know, maybe yeah. we'll focus on sexual abuse, but it ended up becoming like, oh, there are some people that just like to show up because they love our speakers and they know that they're in a safe space. Okay. Do you feel comfortable uh, sharing some of the agreements that you all use? Sure. I won't read them all because each one uh, is about a minute long and there are five, Great. but Great. let's do just page two, the half of page two. Okay. So this is under a category where uh, we are on check your assumptions. And it's where I started reading earlier, just said no, no judgments or self dis or disclaimers or um, self judgments. Everyone here is an individual, not just a representative of a group. We believe in our common best intentions. We are compassionate towards our most oppressed selves as we invite our highest selves to the table. We acknowledge that growth can be messy and healing isn't a linear process. We are generous in our assumptions of others. We all have a right to be human. That's our next clause. Honoring differences always and centering them when appropriate. Acknowledge emotions appropriately, knowing that there aren't any good or bad emotions, only human ones. We respect each other's right to be human, to have a bad day, to be triggered, to fail, etc. Please take care of yourself in those moments. And lastly, I'll read about the braving model by Brene Brown. Um, mm -hmm. Highly recommend all of Brene Brown's books, especially yeah. for artists. I'm sure you know Brene Brown, but here we go. Build through a uh, trust through the braving model by Brene Brown. Respecting boundaries, be reliable, expect and maintain accountability, keep our vault safe. Remember that stories of others aren't yours to share without permission. This includes protecting when we have speakers come, their experiences that they share with us too. We act with integrity, non judgment and generosity towards others. So do you read these before all of your meetings or is it just anybody who joins, this is what they've agreed to in order we, to <laughs> We read them in the room at the same time after we close our doors and they're five times longer than this. Um, and then at the very end of it, we all say, I agree if you agree to them and then we proceed. And I yeah. love that. You're um, so cool. <laughs> all right. You're, You're cool. so cool. You just... And you do so much and you have so much going for you and you're so innovative and grounded and um, thank you. Like, yeah, clear about how you view the world. It's just really awesome. And I'm so grateful to you for being in this space and trusting in our space here um, for this conversation and going on this journey, um, which it absolutely was. Thank um, you. For anybody who is listening who wants to 
work with you, who wants to buy your keyboard, who wants to like follow along for your journey, who wants to participate in um, FCSL, like where can people find you within your own boundaries? Great. So you can find me on Instagram at nomiabody, N-O-M-I-A-B-A-D-I, nomiabody.com, Nori Kitars, um, at Nori, N-O-R-Y Kitars, um, which I have not been posting as much on lately. And that's terrible of me, but um, norikitars.com, um, you, you'll find updates. Right now, there are not going to be any updates about selling it because that's just, I'm not there yet with it. I want to hang on to it and just play a little bit more myself with it. I have the right. patent for 15 more years before it goes public and then anyone right. can make it and produce it and whatever. So sometime in the next 15 years, I will figure out a way to produce that thing. Hopefully, before then. But uh, right now I do have the only one, but I always am happy to hear from people and hear feedback on it and answer people's questions about it. And if anyone wants to talk about timeline on that, we can do that. Uh, they can message me on, on my Instagram or on my website. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for being in this space with us and thank, thank you for you. sharing so openly. And now I'm going to have to write my script about uh, Dennis and oh. um, uh Composing. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text you a picture of Dennis as soon as we hang up. You better. I want a photo <laughs> immediately. <laughs> you got it. Done and done. Thanks so much, Jennifer. You've been amazing. You're welcome. Appreciate so have it. you.